call the meeting to order. This is the meeting of November 16th. <coughs> we'll note that all commissioners are present with the exception of Commissioner Frenzel who's <coughs> absent. First item of business for your consideration is the uh, order of business. Are there any changes to the order of business? President Johnson, I do have, uh, would like to make a request in the order of business that we add two items, uh, which would be under uh, general issues finance section four. Uh, the first item being the uh, elder care public transit agreement. And the second being a request uh, by, uh, uh, for visitors committee funds to support an Eagle Scout project. Both would we, uh, be requesting action on this evening. And I have distributed supporting written language for you. Okay. Are there any other uh, additions or changes to the agenda? Mr. President, I'll move the agenda be approved as amended. Second. As revised. Okay, we have the motion and the second. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote on the motion. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. <coughs> the motion carries. Um, brings us to the consent agenda. Are there any items on the consent agenda you wish to discuss? There's no, di oh, Mr. Carson. Uh, Mr. President, I believe in the consent agenda, uh, item A, Needs correction in the minutes. Uh, to the second. Uh, see here. Okay, well, let's discuss the minutes and we'll bring those out for discussion. Okay, I believe uh, the second to item F on the uh, public land sale original plot, uh, the second was by Commissioner Jackson. Okay, it's listed as. Commissioner Steiner, who was absent. Correct. And uh, Commissioner Jackson, do you recall for certain? Was that, was that you? I believe it was. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, we could ask our clerk to view the tape, see who seconded the motion and, and correct it. At this point, we're thinking it was Mr. Jackson, but uh, we're not sure. So. So the, we would then um, have to approve the minutes as amended. So would there be a motion to that? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Uh, Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Mr. Stukart? Aye. Chair votes aye. The motion carries. Are there any other items on the consent agenda you wish to discuss? Mr. President, I I'll move that we approve items B, C, and D on the consent agenda. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, we'll vote. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mrs. Stukart? Aye. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Chair votes aye. The motion carries. That'll bring us to the non-time timetable agenda. That's tab four. And uh, the first item there is a resolution regarding property tax exemptions for builders and buyers. And I, I know, Mr. Kessel, you have something you'd like to say about this resolution. And perhaps also Mr. Colling does. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I do. Thank you, uh, President Johnson. Uh, if, if you ref reference the memo, um, that I produced, uh, it does say that option number four um, raises the home buyer's exemption to the first 100,000 for two years and establishes a two-year exemption for the first 100,000 for builders with a limit of 10 properties per builder. That is an inaccurate uh, statement. That, that uh, ten limit of 10 per builder should say uh, a limit of five. That is what was endorsed by the um, commission at your last meeting, so I do apologize for that error. I'm allowed one a month, right? No. Yep. I think you're well into 2015 by <laughs> now. <laughs> you're counting. Now I got to be <laughs> nervous. 
Uh, Mr. Colling, anything that you'd want to say by introduction to this resolution? Uh, Mr. President, Commissioners, this was uh, the same resolution that was discussed at uh, your last meeting, and this is uh, simply the option that you elected at that time, put into final form, and available for your approval uh, formally at this meeting. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Colling, Mr. Kessel. Uh, any comments or questions by Commissioners? President, I think uh, we've had good discussion, good public input. I would, I would move that we adopt Resolution 20-2009. Second. We have the motion and the second. Further discussion? Hearing none, uh, we'll proceed to vote then on the resolution. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Stukart? Aye. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Um, we'll move to item B, which is the fire department pension plan. Uh, this is a, an ordinance, uh, number 1375. Uh, this would be the uh, second reading and possible final passage. Um, I know, Mr. Colling, you introduced it at the previous meeting, but would you care to introduce it again, please? Yes, Mr. President, Commissioners, uh, the ordinance before you incorporates some updates to the current uh, fire code or fire department pension plan. Um, these updates uh, were suggested at uh, uh, the recommendation of our attorneys, Dorsey and Whitney, that handle the pension plan. It allows the, uh, this part of the pension plan to uh, come into compliance with certain IRS uh, regulations and requirements. Uh, it is unchanged from the version that was in your packet last time around. There's anyone from the public that would like to comment regarding this uh, proposed ordinance? You may do so now. Just step to the podium, state your name, we'll hear your comments. No one from the public that wishes to comment. Any comments by uh, any s member of the city staff or city commission? No comments there. Would there be a motion regarding this uh, proposed ordinance? I'll make a motion to, uh, to, to approve Ordinance 1375. Okay. We have the motion for the approval and final passage. Is there a second? Second. We have the motion and second. Any discussion? No discussion. We'll vote. Mrs. Dukert? Aye. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Brings us to uh, item C which is uh, the street light utility ordinance. This would be the first reading. Uh, Mr. Kessel or Mr. Colling, anything by introduction you would like to add? Thank you, President Johnson and Commission. Uh, the street light utility, as you know, was endorsed, the concept was endorsed through the uh, approval of the 2010 budget uh, in order to create <coughs> the street light utility. We have to do, do so via ordinance. Um, this reading uh, is, or first reading, suggested first reading, uh, encompasses the creation of that streetlight utility. Uh, there would be an additional resolution that would be, uh, that would create the fee structure, uh, and that would be proposed at the time of second reading uh, for the streetlight utility. And I would defer to uh, Attorney Colling for any further explanation. Uh, Mr. President, I don't have anything further for this ordinance. Okay. Again, if there's anyone from the public that wishes to comment uh, regarding this proposed uh, ordinance, you may do so now. Just step to the podium, state your name, and we'll hear your comments. No one from the public that wishes to comment. Any comments from other members of the city staff or city commission? I think, Mr. President, it's worth repeating what we did talk about a few weeks ago and help me with the number again, but we have approximately, is it 30% of properties in the city that um, we don't collect property tax from? Commissioner Jackson, that would be accurate. Okay. Um, you know, this is, in the whole scheme of the budget, a relatively small thing, but it does give us the ability to take that portion of the budget and spread it to all properties, in effect, spread it to all properties in the city, and I think the public needs to be reminded of that. Um, this is a year that, that the budget did not increase property tax, correct? 
Correct, the general fund. Other than the new properties coming on. Um, so again, we just, I think, need to keep putting that perspective out there for everybody. Okay, thank you, thank you, Commissioner Jackson. Anybody else wish to comment? I just have one question, um, Mr. President. How did, how do you determine the water meter size? I was going over that and trying to figure out, like, you have, we have two dollars up to the one inch, and then after that, it goes up. How do you determine that? If I may, President Johnson, Commissioners, the water meter size is determined by the service line, uh, the water service line that comes into your residence, your place of business, or otherwise. So uh, the, the higher the water, uh, or the, the larger the diameter of the water service line, the, the same size meter is attached to that water line. So the, the general concept is if you have a uh, higher, or, or higher diameter water service line, you're going to be a business that uh, requires a great deal of water and therefore um, your revenue streams would support a, a slightly higher expense. So the six inch would be like a school building or? That would be a very large property okay. um, that would require a six inch. Those are rare. Uh, Engineer Soren, you may even know a couple off the top of your head. I don't know specifically, I guess, what would be a six inch, but like an apartment complex that has 24 units is going to have a larger size. Um, a trailer court uh, that we have in town, we have a meter for the whole court, has a larger size going in to feed those. Um, you know, some of our bigger stores, the mall, they would all have larger size meters to, to meet the demands of the water usage for, for facilities like that. Um, you know, typical um, single-family house is going to have like a one-inch meter. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Now, would there be a motion regarding the first reading of this ordinance? I'll make the motion, <coughs> Mr. President. <coughs> Uh, ordinance 1376. Okay, we have the motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. We have the motion and the second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Mr. Stuckert? Aye. Chair votes aye. That motion carries. We'll move to item D. Item D is a request to appoint an alternate judge. Uh, for the Dickinson Municipal Court. <coughs> and uh, Mr. Kessel, would you care to introduce this, please? Thank you, President Johnson, Commissioners. Uh, Municipal Judge Keo has conducted a rather extensive search to replace our alternative uh, municipal judge. Um, Ms. Sellinger has resigned her position. Um, he's been un unable to locate a, a local, um, tra legally trained uh, individual to take on that position. Uh, our state law says that any, any city with a population over 5,000 requires a municipal judge to be uh, trained uh, to have a legal background and training. Um, so the, the pool is, is rather small to begin with. Um, judge Keo, the people that he has approached have turned him down. Uh, he does have two pending cases that require disposition. Uh, they have for some time. So he is recommending that we appoint the Mandan Municipal Judge. Uh, her name uh, is Danae Kautzman. Uh, she's been serving as a Municipal Judge in Mandan for some time. Uh, he has a personal, he knows her personally and uh, recommends her highly for this position. She would accept the same compensation that uh, Alternate Judge Selinger was receiving. Uh, now there, there would be a slight increase uh, due to travel time that would be required to come to Dickinson and such. So um, he will continue to look for a local uh, attorney to take that, to be the alternate municipal judge. But until that time, Judge Keo and I would recommend that uh, you appoint Judge Danae Kautzman as the alternative municipal judge. Thank you, Mr. Kessel. Any comments, questions by the members of the commission? Not. Will there be a motion regarding this item? I'll make a motion to uh, appoint Judge Danae Kautzman as the alternate. Is there a second? Second. <coughs> we have the motion and the second. Any other discussion? 
Hearing none, uh, we'll vote then. Mr. Stuckert? Aye. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. It's 5.30. Uh, we do have a 5.30 timetable agenda item, <clears throat> and that's property tax abatement hearing regarding the uh, tornado damage. So at this time, we'll declare that hearing open and invite City Assessor Jan Zent to the podium. Thank you, President Johnson and Commissioners. This agenda item is dealing with 31 property owners that have filed a property tax abatement for a reduction in their 2009 valuation due to the tornado. A 50% reduction was given to these properties <clears throat> that were demolished or not livable for the remaining six months of the 2009 taxable year. Included are uh, the abatement forms that you should have in your hand and also a spreadsheet that shows the 2009 total true and full value and then the post tornado total true and full value. I am recommending approval of these abatements based on the damage to the affected properties. If you have any questions, I'd be willing to answer them. Thank you, Mrs. Zent. Uh, any questions or comments by commissioners? I have a question. Uh, I didn't try to do the math, but the 1.6 million approximately in reduced valuation, what's that going to mean, bottom line, in property taxes? Okay, the, um, Commissioner Jackson, are you referring to the, the post-tornado total true and fill value, 2.2,396,000? Is that the valuation figure you're looking at? Yeah, it looks like we're, looks like the total reduction in valuation is about 1.6 million. Oh, the difference. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. So you're looking at approximately um, uh, about 70,000 in taxable valuation, which in tax dollars would equate to about approximately $30,000. Okay. Is that total tax ass assessment or just for the city? It's the total total mill levy including all the taxing entities so I so you our share 5% or so is our yeah. city right. share okay. right. yeah. yeah that's the total okay good thank you other comments questions oh, okay thank you thank you is there anybody else from the public that, that would wish to comment uh, on these tax abatements. Uh, Mr. Colling, uh, can we act on these tonight? Yes, you may. Okay. And the uh, if we care to act favorably on these, or the motions just the motion just to approve uh, the tax abatements as presented. Uh, that's correct. Uh, we looked into whether or not a separate vote would have to be held on each of the 31 properties, and that's not required. Uh, you can approve the slate as uh, Ms. Zent has produced it to you, and approve that all as one in one motion. Okay. All right. If there's no one else from the public that wishes to comment, we'll declare the public hearing closed and uh, ask the commission if there's any action you'd like to take on this item. I'd like to make a motion to approve the tax exemption. Okay, we have the motion to approve the uh, tax exemptions or the abatements as presented. Is there a second? I will second. And we have a second. Other discussion? Hearing none, then we'll vote. Mrs. Stuckert? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. We'll return to the um, non-timetable agenda, uh, and that new item E, the uh, elder care uh, contract. And Mr. Kessel, are you introducing that, or is Mr. Colling? I'll take care of that, President Johnson. I may refer to Attorney Colling uh, for some specifics. Um, the elder care agreement that I've would like you to review it was approved by the City Commission on um, July 20th. Um, that contract has uh, languished with the Elder Care uh, Board for some time. In review of that contract, they have uh, signed it, but they have made a couple of, of minor changes. Uh, the first change is represented on page one, item two, public transit services. It's in the second paragraph or second sentence of that section. 
Uh, it currently reads, Elder Care's Public Transit Services shall consist of both pre-scheduled and on-demand public transit as set forth in this agreement. What they'd like to do is add three words, those words being as a vendor after Elder Care's and between uh, after Elder Care's and before public. Um, there is another addition, and I'll explain that one, and then I'll tell you why. Uh, that would be on page um, five, item number six, under subsidy payment for services rendered. It was in the first paragraph. Uh, the city shall, from time to time, is at, in the sole discretion of its board of city commissioners, uh, grant elder care an annual operating subsidy in such amounts as the city commission may determine. What they uh, suggested is they've lined out grant and put give and added after elder care and before N uh, as a vendor, the same language that uh, they suggested on the first page. The reason for the, the change as a vendor is because they receive rather significant amount of, of grant funds from public agencies, uh, both from the federal uh, state and then from uh, the city of Dickinson. Um, if you receive funds in excess of $500,000, it triggers a, a next level audit. Um, that audit is quite comprehensive and quite expensive uh, for them. Um, and it's very difficult to find a firm that will actually conduct this audit in uh, Western North Dakota. Um, they are a vendor. Uh, we've, we've always approached them as a vendor. So these, these changes, um, in my opinion, are um, not significant. Um, but I, I would certainly ask Attorney Cooling for his opinion on the matter as well. Uh, Mr. President, Commissioners, I uh, agree with uh, the comments that Mr. Kessel has expressed. It's my understanding that the language that uh, they're intending to include in here is intended to make clear that elder care exists as uh, a service provider, an independent service provider to the city and not as an agency of the, of the city government. Um, to that extent, uh, the, the changes they're recommending are not objectionable, and I would have no problem approving this agreement as, as amended. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Colling and Mr. Kessel. Any comments or questions by uh, commissioners? Mr. President, I'll move we approve the amended agreement. Second. We have a motion, the second. Any discussion? Hearing none, then uh, we'll vote. Mr. Jackson. Aye. Mrs. Dukart. Aye. Mr. Steiner. Aye. Chair votes aye. The motion carries. Uh, the uh, item F involving uh, the request uh, for for funds to do an Eagle Scout project was the Eagle Scout going to be here to help with that? Uh, he was invited to attend, and I expected him to do so. But I see he's not in the audience at this time. I think we also thought we probably wouldn't get to this till after our uh, six o'clock timetable agenda item. Did you communicate that to him? I did. I, I told him uh, at six o'clock at the earliest. I think uh, what we'll do then <coughs> is we'll just defer that till later in the meeting in, uh, in anticipation of, of him arriving. So <coughs> we'll, we'll go on to public safety then uh, and Chief Sivak. President Johnson, Commissioners, in addition to the regular monthly report, I have just two items I'd like to mention to you. Standing off the northwest corner, or I should say the northeast corner of the Central Fire Station, you'll see a new flagpole. The flagpole that was on the station for many years, which is, was attached to the exterior of the second floor, uh, was taken down for safety reasons. And because of structural damage that happened to the building, it was determined that it wasn't prudent to reattach a flagpole in that position. The pole that you'll see standing there is uh, through the generosity of one of our members, personal donation from Assistant Fire Chief Ed Sticka and his wife Renee, and a donation of cash from the Fire Department barbecue team known as the Smoke and Irons barbecue team. Uh, cooperation from Dickinson Ready Mix and product and from Big K Industries and some uh, material that uh, they loaned us to help us get the job done. So in essence, we have a brand new flagpole at the Central Fire Station that uh, didn't come out of our budget. It was due to the generosity of our members and of the citizens and of the business community, and I want to thank them all for that. 
in addition to that speaking of new things we have a new truck the city of dickinson has a new fire truck in the station we're busy at this time outfitting it with its loose equipment and we will start training on it this week we hope to have it in service as the first truck out the doors by the middle of december and with that i will take any questions Thank you, uh, Chief Sivak. I'm, I'm sure before there are any questions, uh, all the commissioners uh, would feel the same as I that we would like you to express our thank you to uh, Assistant Chief uh, Sticka and to uh, all the businesses that either contributed materials or, or labor to construct the new flagpole. Um, <coughs> that's uh, it's really great, and we certainly appreciate uh, uh, that kind of community support. So please extend our thank yous to them. We will do so. Um, all right. Anybody got a really tough question now for the <laughs> chief? Yeah. yeah. I do. Um, are you going to have it in the parade of lights so we can see it? Well, you know, we're we're going to try to, okay. and uh, we open the invitation to any and all of you to stop down and see it. We were going to uh, possibly bring it and uh, for the end of a commission meeting, but this time of year the weather may not cooperate. But uh, hopefully we'll see it in the parade of lights. Okay. And uh, just, you know, for uh, the public's information, again, can, if you recall, um, this replaces a truck that's, that's uh, how old and what are some of the new capabilities that we have with this truck that say we didn't have with the previous This one. replaces a 1973 pumper. One of the things that happens for a community the size of Dickinson, a 1973 pumper no longer gains us anything in the insurance rating and the, the public protection classification number that the insurance service office assigns to a community. The City of Dickinson Fire Department is a class four rated department. One of the reasons that we are is because of the equipment we have. Uh, the 50% uh, of that rating is made up of the fire department, 50% of it's made up of the infrastructure. So it, it's, it behooves the city to stay current with the equipment to help maintain that classification to help with insurance premiums for residential and commercial customers. The, uh, the truck is an automatic. The old truck is not. This truck has a 1,500 gallon per minute pump, um, a lot of electronic, very easy push button controls. The old truck uh, was a 1,250 gallon per minute, so we gained some there. Uh, no longer meets its pump test, so we lost you know, on that end with the old truck. Uh, ergonomics of this truck is a big thing. This thing was designed, was custom built for the city of Dickinson by the manufacturer. It was designed so that firefighters can reach up into the hose beds while standing flat on the ground grab the nozzle, grab the attack line, and proceed to the fire. You don't necessarily, you don't have to step up on a, on a tailboard or step up on a step to reach something. Very ergonomically designed. Seat belts for everyone. Seating capacity for six and everybody's belted in. Safety, uh, the, the structure, the way the cab is built, the way the body is built. Uh, well, as you can imagine, you compare a 1973 Ford or Chevrolet to a 2009 or a 2010 model, same type of comparison, which is light years ahead of what we had. And I'd like to thank the commission for the consideration you gave to the Marmoth Fire Department's request. Uh, it, we're truly doing that community a good service. A lot of times there's a misconception that a fire protection district is a county fire department and, and county funds are available. Fire protection districts aren't structured that way. They're their own entity. Uh, there have been some comments that have come back to us that, well, the city of Marmoth must be flush with oil money. The, the, the county must be able to take care of them. It's not the case. It's the, they're a fire protection district. They have a budget of less than $7,000 a year. What uh, you did by your consideration of seeing this truck go to a neighboring community was a very good thing. It was a very good thing for them, and I appreciate you doing that. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Chief Rummel, <coughs> uh, do you have anything for police report? Oh, okay. Well, then we'll wait with you. Okay. It's five. It's close enough to 5:45. We have a 5:45 timetable agenda item, and that's to hear from Dr. Richard McCollum, the uh, president of Dickinson State University and he's going to give us an update. So welcome, Dr. McCollum. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, members of the commission. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. I'd like to take a little bit of time and give you an update and an overview on 
activities and programs and developments at DSU. I will make reference during my remarks to some of the handouts that you have in the packet before you. I want to begin by uh, expressing a sincere thanks to you as a city, to the city police department, to the county and to the county sheriff's department for the help that you extended to DSU and to the families during the time when we lost those three students two weeks ago. We very much appreciate your support and as we continue to move forward, I wanted to take this opportunity to say sincere thanks. When you begin to look at the programs and the development of activities at DSU, one of the things that I wanted to bring your attention to, and I will just touch upon it, but in your packet you have uh, on the right-hand side of the folder an outline of the plan that is underway for our future. It has been nicknamed DSU 2015 simply because when we met as a planning committee last year, we started thinking about how we want to proceed into the next four or five years. 2015 is a significant time period for us. First of all, it is the next time that we face our 10-year reaccreditation with the North Central accreditation process. It also is the benchmark year where we stand on the threshold for a centennial celebration in 2018. And so I would draw your attention very briefly to page five, and you will see outlined on page five a vision statement for the next four or five years. We seek to become premier university in the upper Great Plains. This is a vision statement that was developed by the committee that you see outlined on page four. It's very representative of not only the community of Dickinson and of the campus, but also representative of neighboring communities in and around Western North Dakota. You will also see after this large committee met seven times this last academic year that we forged the development of seven major goals that we think we want to pursue in a very active way to forge the future, to make this vision become a reality. I will draw your attention very quickly to page three, and as you can see, I want to focus on the synchronization of effort. We could have a series of committees and teams working on goals and cornerstones and accreditation criteria. What we have chosen to do is to synchronize our effort for efficiency. And we have organized five teams. These five teams are anchored around the accreditation criteria that you see listed here for HLC, Higher Learning Commission. Those same teams are guiding on cornerstones that are given to us by the State Board of Higher Education. And there is congruence between the criteria for accreditation and the cornerstones that we receive from the State Board of Higher Education. We then synchronize those seven goals, again, based on the congruence of those goals with the cornerstones and the criteria. So we have five teams that now represent more than 40 people actively meeting and pursuing the accreditation criteria, the board's cornerstones and guidance, and the goals that we have outlined for DSU 2015. The whole planning assumption on this is the fact that we can forge our future, we can seek to become a premier university in the upper Great Plains, and we are doing it with focused effort and a commitment and an intention to make that vision a reality. On the left-hand side of your packet, Towards the back, you will see a brochure that is labeled Hallmarks of Distinction. I will just briefly touch upon some of the benchmarks that you see in this brochure. This is a brochure that we put together last spring. We debuted and used it for the first time when we hosted an evening with the legislature. What you will find within this brochure is a series of major accomplishments that have either been accomplished through program activities in our curriculum or various kinds of activities that are part of our campus life. You will see in there a number of distinctions that we are very proud of. And as you look at that, I can tell you that some of those distinctions have already been surpassed. For example, our athletic program in here, you will see that it received the Commissioner's Cup it just received the Commissioner's Cup again this last 
close of the last academic year. That means that for four out of the last five years, DSU and the Dakota Athletic Conference has won the Commissioner's Cup. That is based on a competitive scale where you take all of the athletic teams and you rate them by points and you achieve the winning score by competition. We have 15 athletic teams registered with NAIA. All of them compete in the Dakota Athletic Conference competition and that is part of how we were successful with the Commissioner's Cup. We also have two athletic teams that are part of the national rodeo circuit and those teams have been doing very well in national competition as you know. Another handout that you will see relates to our enrollment and there is a PowerPoint chart in there that shows 14 consecutive years of enrollment growth. It is a barometer, it is an indicator of positive momentum. Again, this is a goal that we per proceed with very focused effort. The headwinds on recruiting students are significant. The demographics are significant in terms of the challenge that they bring us with the decline of high school graduates in the upper Midwest. But we are seeking to increase our enrollment in a very intentional way. We are part of the changing face of higher education. Ten years ago, you will notice we did not have many part-time students. Today, you can see that the number of part-time students has increased significantly in the last 10 years. That is not unique to DSU. It is not unique to North Dakota. It is part of the changing face of higher education across the country. You may be interested in knowing a little bit about the top five majors that our students pursue in our curriculum. The largest major is undeclared. We have a large number of students who come to us in an undeclared fashion and they need some time to sort through what kinds of programs they want to major in. And part of our faculty and staff commitment to those students is to help them to discover the kinds of program opportunities that match up with their goals and their aspirations. But setting those large numbers aside, and it's more than 700 students, I wanted you to just simply see the way we look in terms of the top five program areas in terms of majors. Our normal school legacy for many, many years, teacher ed was the largest program in terms of enrollment. The last two years, business has surpassed that as a program major, but not by much. It's very, very close. But I just thought you might enjoy seeing the way the breakout of our enrollment and our program majors occur. A Couple of things regarding our outreach effort. We very, very much appreciate the support that you as a city provide in helping us conduct the Theodore Roosevelt Symposiums. The Theodore Roosevelt Symposium, we just completed our fourth symposium. It uh, increased in terms of the number of people that participated. <coughs> we very much want to continue the symposium effort. It brings a great deal of intellectual activity to our campus. And so I draw your attention to the Save the Date card and the Theodore Roosevelt Association handout. The Save the Date card, our next symposium, 2010, has already been set, September 16th through the 18th. And the focus is going to be the presidential years of TR. Following the 2010 symposium, you will see a 2011 projected date, and that is an exciting development for us because we are going to simultaneously host the Theodore Roosevelt Association's annual meeting as part of our symposium. And I just draw this to your attention because when you look at this particular handout, you can see that most of the TR Association meetings are on the East Coast in major cities. They are going next year to Seattle, but in 2011, we're really proud to be able to say that the Theodore Roosevelt Association is going to be with us on campus for their annual meeting in conjunction with our annual symposium. Tentatively, and we're really excited about this, but tentatively, 
for 2011 the keynote speaker is projected to be Ken Burns and we're excited about the chance to bring him to Dickinson and to include him in the discussions relative to not only the Theodore Roosevelt Symposium but also the digital library that we are trying to develop in conjunction with the Library of Congress and other organizations. That is an exciting development for the campus, for the community, for the state of North Dakota. We're seeking to provide a comprehensive digital library for Theodore Roosevelt. We just received a couple of weeks ago a letter from Harvard. Harvard is going to join us. They have 55,000 key documents that were not part of the Library of Congress collection. And if we're able to successfully convert those to digital files, the entire database will be enhanced in a significant way. I also wanted to bring, as part of the outreach conversation, just for your information, we are collaborating with other universities in the state of North Dakota, funding made available through funds coming from Senator Dorgan's office and from Congress. But we are excited about hosting two national energy symposiums here in Dickinson. And I'll bring this to your attention and you'll see the dates on the card. These national symposiums will be state-of-the-art conversations relative to energy development and energy issues. And we're excited about having that here in Dickinson. And we're forecasting, as you can see, the first conference we're working with Minot State and it will be in March. The second conference will be here in Dickinson in August of 2010. Our Strom Center continues to be a viable part of our DSU effort and I have enclosed the most recent brochure. There are six lines of effort that are going out there at the Strom Center and I know that you and many of the businesses in the community have been actively engaged in those Strom Center efforts and we thank you for that. I want to close with a couple of updates regarding the BAC and our hope for addition to the library. First, the library. As you know, there is a trigger legislation that is pending that is anchored off the projected balance for the general revenue account. If the actual balance in the general revenue account for the state of North Dakota exceeds the projection by 25 million on December 31st, we will be authorized 8.8 .8 million for a 40,000 square foot addition to our library. Our proposal in that 40,000 square foot addition is to also embed within that 40,000 square feet a new home for the Theodore Roosevelt Center, a new home for the digital library that we are committed to develop for Theodore Roosevelt. We remain very hopeful that the state economy will make that 8.8 .8 million possible. Relative to the Badlands Activity Center, I know that many of you in the community have enjoyed football games at the BAC. As you know, the field, the track are complete. The video board and the scoreboard are up. The lights are up. And the building is progressing in a very timely manner. We continue to be on schedule relative to that building with the goal of doing the quality checklist, the punch list, somewhere around the 15th of April. The hope is that at that point the building will be complete and it will be available for community activities, various kinds of events, and of course uh, the track season that we all are looking forward to next spring. We are maintaining a contingency pool for that construction project. We are following best practice relative to that contingency. We are still under budget and we still maintain a contingency pool of about 5%. The BAC has been for more than a year three simultaneous lines of effort. One is what I have considered government coordination. And when I say that, that state, county, and city. That coordination effort also includes the State Board of Higher Education and the Chancellor's Office. And we are working very actively on that line of effort to keep everyone informed and to make sure that we are synchronized in that particular coordination. The second line of effort is the construction effort. Synchronizing the architect, the construction manager, the contractors that are working on the project, 
and making sure that we stay on time and we stay on budget relative to that particular total effort. The third line of effort is the fundraising effort. That effort continues and as you know, seeking private contributions through the DSU Foundation as well as the support that we have received through the pledge from the city, we are working towards a $16 million finance plan that will underwrite a $16 million complex. Now there is a fourth line of effort that I have not talked about before, but I want to just briefly touch upon today. That fourth line of effort is what we are calling the operation budget. That facility went into operation last August. And we are charged to maintain an operating budget that's balanced. There is a bit of confusion in the community because some people believe that the money that has been donated for the construction of the complex should, in fact, take care of the operating budget. But the fact is the operating budget is separate from the construction budget. And I draw your attention to this particular enclosure because this predate, predates me. But back in 2007, the state board passed a resolution which requires us to maintain a contingency fund that will secure a balanced budget for the operation of the BAC. As you know, the Joint Powers Agreement creates a development board. We are working actively with the development board to develop and project an operating budget that balances out in terms of expenses and revenue. Your city manager represents the city on that development board. This is a work in progress. We have never had a complex like the BAC. We don't have a history of what we think the revenue and the expenses will be. Everything at this point is a projection, but we are charged by the State Board of Higher Education to ensure that the operating budget balances and that in that operating budget we are building some kind of reserve because at some point in time in the future, the track's going to need maintenance, the track's going to have to be replaced, the turf's going to have to be replaced, and the complex is going to need general maintenance. So that fourth line of effort, the operating budget, is a new emerging line of effort that we are working very hard to be successful with. That's a really quick overview. I'd be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you, Dr. McCollum. Uh, any comments or questions? Uh, do you have a, a feel for how large the uh, TR Association's annual events normally are? I, kn I know I attended one here a few years ago in Washington, D.C., but I went to the one that they just recently conducted in Florida and they had about 250 individuals there. I'm told that when they stay on the East Coast, they sometimes have somewhere around 300 to 350. But when they move away from the East Coast, the participation drops to somewhere around 250. They had 250 in Florida. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks well, for the opportunity to be here. Well, we uh, we appreciate the update, and uh, <clears throat> we know it's been a tough two weeks for you and uh, for DSU and and the community. And uh, we certainly want to express our condolences to you and and the student body and the faculty and the staff there at Dickinson State over the loss of the three students. It was a very tragic, very tragic accident. And, I was very uh, impressed with uh, the families of the, uh, the students. Uh, I was impressed with you and the student body and, and how they conducted themselves. It uh, spoke very well of Dickinson State and our community. So thank again, you again, our much. condolences. Thank you.
We have a six o'clock uh, public hearing, and this is regarding the hospitality tax uh, proposed ordinance changes. We'll declare the public hearing open. Anyone that wishes to comment may do so. Just step to the podium, state your name, and we'll hear your comments. Is there anybody that wishes to comment? Well, I'd like to comment if no one else <coughs> comment. Um, what I've um, just handed out to uh, the commission is a table of the four sales taxes that exist in the city and in that table it's a table of use of funds authorizations and I've taken the language either right out of the city ordinances or right out of the North Dakota Century Code regarding how those funds are to be used and just put them side by side. So there are four <coughs> different city sales taxes. Each tax has a different use of funds definition which is codified in either North Dakota state law or city ordinance. The occupancy tax has the most limited definition of use of funds. The other three sales taxes have multiple use of fund options. While each use of funds definition is different, there is some overlap in use of funds authorization between taxes. For example, funding for the Badlands Activity Center meets both the requirements of the 30% portion of sales tax two and the requirements of the hospitality tax. The inclusion of the word tourism in the hospitality tax use of funds definition allows the hospitality tax to be used for visitor promotion in the same manner as the occupancy tax. Since there's multiple uses of fund options available, there are spending choices to be made. And making choices means determining priorities. In North Dakota, the discussions and debate regarding the setting of priorities and spending decisions for public money are to be done in a public meeting by the elected governing body that is accountable to the voters. Ordinances that require a fixed percentage spending allocation to non-government entities automatically removes those funds from other alternative public uses. Fixed percentage allocation ordinances remove those funds from public debate by the elected governing body regarding spending priorities and choices. Fixed percentage allocation ordinances transfer accountability for those funds to a non-elected board. The outcome is the non-elected board not having to justify its spending choices to the elective governing body or the public. A number of supporters for fixed percentage allocation funding to the CVB said they support the status quo because it takes the politics out of funding the CVB. I agree. It does take the politics out of funding of the CVB. I support the ordinance change because it puts the politics back into the CVB funding process. Budgeting of public funds should be part of, of, of the political process. Politics is debating and deciding between competing spending choices and priorities in a public meeting. Politics is allowing public input to be heard. Politics is, a, is the elective governing body annually taking responsibility for its entire budget. Second to choosing a city administrator, preparing and approving the annual budget is the most important action the city commission takes. I believe what the fixed percentage allocation, annual allocation does is take public input, transparency, and account accountability from that portion of the budgeting process. 
If energy prices remain strong and oil development continues to grow in the Dickinson area, the present funding formula for the CVB will produce about $500,000 by 2011. The recent rapid growth of the occupancy tax and the hospitality tax are being driven by the energy sector rather than tourism. I question the need and the priority to allocate that amount of money to visitor promotion. The CVB, as of 12-31-08, had a reserve fund of about $200,000. There was no public debate and public vote by the governing body to establish this reserve. State law authorizes two funds, a City Visitors Promotion Fund and a City Visitors Capital Construction Fund. State law does not authorize a third reserve fund to be held by the Convention and Visitors Bureau. I support removing the requirement to grant the CVB a minimum of 20% of the hospitality tax. Furthermore, I propose the City Commission expand this ordinance change to eliminate the requirement that all proceeds of the occupancy tax be dedicated to the Dickinson CVB. These amounts should be determined annually by the City Commission during the normal budgeting process. This was the process prior to June 1997 when the present ordinances were enacted. I don't understand why the CVB should be exempt from the same budgeting process that city departments and other outside organizations are subject to annually. The governing body of the city is the taxing entity and charged by the state legislature with the responsibility for managing and administering these funds. The governing body of the city is abdicating its responsibility to transparency, accountability, and public input by having fixed percentage funding allocations to third parties. Well, that concludes my statement. Is there anybody else that wishes to comment during the hearing? I would like to. Mr. Jackson. Uh, let me confirm first of all that we're probably going to be voting on this issue at the next meeting. I think if uh, we can confirm that we would have all five commissioners present, uh, we would put it on the agenda to vote. Okay. Um, you know, we don't get the opportunity to talk about this except at meetings, and I think it's important that we do. I agree with the philosophical point that money shouldn't be transferred in an unlimited fashion to an entity that has, doesn't have direct accountability to the taxpayer. It's not inappropriate in my mind that the commission revisit the mechanics and the reasons for the CVB subsidy or any other subsidy as far as I'm concerned. I think we have to take care, however, that we're not micromanaging. I don't think we want to do that. We entrust people with uh, dollars and with decisions. I think the issue of politics is one that we have to contend with. Um, I think that the original concept of the hosp hospitality tax probably had that in mind when it was done. And I think we really have to be careful of that. I also think it's appropriate that a local government, in our case, this commission, uh, scrutinize an entity's reserve amount, probably more than any other detail in a budget by some other entity. This is difficult because the individuals involved with CVB, Visitors Committee, however we want to say it, are people who have been really loyal to this community and really have made things happen in this community. Um, but I think that we need to openly call on the CVB, start development, and any other entity who is receiving tax dollars to, from time to time, voluntarily come before this board and maybe reduce their own subsidy as the case may be, as it's called for. 
times have changed and I do think that this ordinance needs changing. I'm not sure tonight, personally, how it should change. And we'll decide that in the next three weeks at the next meeting. But I do think it has to change. Uh, we've had di good discourse the last, what, month on the topic and, and we've got a lot of people trying to do the right thing. Um, when these issues are deliberated, not everybody's going to come away happy. But um, I do think something needs to change in the ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. <clears throat> Anyone else care to comment? I would just like to make one comment, Mr. President. Um, the public in general is confused at this point, I think, too, because of the way um, we've had the input. We haven't really had any public other than the CVB board members coming and talking either uh, in our presentations. But when I get emails saying that, well, maybe if they have 200,000 reserve, maybe we need to reduce the tax to half percent. And then we have to explain to them that, no, this is being distributed for to many different areas that we just have all we're really asking them to do, in my opinion, is come to the budget meetings um, like all the other departments do and ask for their funding. I would not say that we are not going to give you any funding. That is not the intent. Um, we are a growing community and we want to keep growing. And I just want to clarify that to all of the people that are watching TV on and our meetings and we do not have a surplus of money. That is not the intent of this. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dukert. Mayor, Mayor and Commissioners, uh, my name is Bernie Marsh with the Esquire Club downtown Dickinson, and I am not on the board of the CVB, and I did make my statement against the vote. So there are people that are not on the board that did speak last week. There are other ones that are not on the board also. Thank you, Mr. Marsh. Is there anyone else? If there's no one else, then we'll declare the public hearing closed. And uh, we'll move back to our regular agenda. And uh, Chief Rummel, I think you're next. Good evening, Mr. President, commissioners. In your packets, you will find a, um, a couple of reports. The first one I'd like to just briefly go over is uh, by Sergeant Dustin Dossinger, and it's the 2000, our October 2009 traffic services report. Um, as you can see from this report, there's been a slight, or there has been a spike in accidents. We're up um, to 83 accidents that were reported in, in October. Um, 63 of those were full report. Um, and um, three of those were injury accidents. You also see that there was um, 24 total school zones um, contacts that were made for the month of uh, October. I also attached to that report, you will find a page from uh, a report that Becky Bozowski passed on and I just received in October. This is concerning the seatbelt usage survey that was done by the DLN Consulting Incorporated and in cooperation with the North Dakota Department of Transportation. The results indicate that occupant, both driver and passenger seatbelt use in Stark County is down from 85.3% last year, which Stark County was ranked number one amongst all the counties in North Dakota for use of seatbelts, down to 74% in 2009. Uh, this, this survey was taken the first week of June and uh, it showed that the overall rate for the state is 81.5. So we even fell short of the overall state report. Uh, a complete report is available upon request, but uh, I found it rather interesting. It goes into um, different vehicles and, and, and that kind of thing, uh, use of roadway type, um, seat belt used by gender, that kind of thing. So it's kind of an interesting report. In the first week of October, I was able to attend the 100. Uh, uh, yes. Rumble, just I mean, it's like 
said you found it interesting, but why do you think why do you think there is that drop? That's fairly significant, and and it is I, I think it's pretty well accepted that that seat belts do save lives. And it is. And as I, I really encourage, we really do as a police department and law enforcement, encourage the use of seatbelts. I think um, it, 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 many people feel when they're on the roadways on the interstate or on uh, out, of, out of sight of city limits that they wear their seatbelts then, it's the most dangerous then. But in fact, there's a lot of accidents as you saw in the report in town that people get hurt in. There were three injury reported accidents. Um, I don't understand why it, wouldn't, it went down so significantly this year. Um, there is no, there's no reasoning in the report for it to go down, but it is down. And so we're going to work hard through grants. As you know, there's, there's grants available for officers to utilize overtime and enforce seat belts. And we're going to take advantage of all the, all the times that, that grant money comes in. And of course, the officers are aware of it throughout um, their normal duties, daily duties as well. So, sorry, I can't answer the, that question. Okay. Any other questions on that one or comments? We're going to work hard at bringing it back up. We want to be number one again. Moving on, on the first week of, of October, I was able to attend the 116th Annual Inter, um, <coughs> International Association of Chiefs of Police Conference that was conducted in Denver, Colorado. It was a really good experience, and there was some excellent training that I was a, um, opportunities that I was able to take advantage of, uh, networking with other chiefs, and there were over 800 vendors present, and they were showing the latest in technologies. Um, I did receive a call from Sean while I was down in Denver, and he, he, he sliced up my credit card, so I, I wasn't able to uh, <laughs> go all out. He knows how weak I am when it comes to that kind of thing. But there's some neat technology out there um, for law enforcement to utilize, and it just, you could go probably technology broke if you wanted to do that. The last item I would like to bring to your attention, this is just for report, but um, Mr. Soren and I were asked to look into a problem of, of parking, of vehicles parking. <coughs> um, vehicles such as horse trailers and, and campers that are being parked on the streets throughout Dickinson for extended periods of time. Um, there is presently a 48 hour time limit ordinance that is, that is on the books, and, but it is very difficult it is, and, and lengthy to enforce because there's a constant follow-up required. And so with that, with that 48 hours, if we don't run across some obvious evidence that that vehicle has been parked there for 48 hours, what we usually do then as to, to ensure that is we chalk the tires and then we wait for another 48 hours and then we sticker and ticket it and before it gets moved, there's another 48 hours involved. So with that lengthy follow-up and um, the number of complaints we received, it is an extreme, but, but um, in checking in for 2008, there were 118 such complaints. And this year, thus far, there's 102 such complaints. Now I know that many complaints I get personally, I'll be walking down a street or people run into me, because it's neighbors, they don't want to get that involved. They don't want to start a neighborhood dispute. And so many complaints don't go get called in because of, because of that very reason. But I do know that there are more than those complaining on campers and, 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 and trailers that get parked. Now, when these owners of these vehicles see that, all they have to do is move the vehicle to comply with the law three to ten feet. That's it. So it really doesn't address the situation. One of the solutions my staff and I were talking about, and we were talking with Mr. Soren, was, was a possibility of a calendar parking ordinance. Such an ordinance, ordinance would mean that on certain days, from, for instance, 1 a.m. to 7 a.m., you would not be able to park on streets. On other days, you would not be able to park on avenues, ensuring that vehicles would have to be moved. Now, um, there, there has been calendar parking in, in various communities in Minnesota, and once it gets established and it, it becomes part of routine, it seems to work very well. 
it has a couple different things um, uh, assets to it as well there the fact that our officers would have to be going into the residential for some extended period of time is not bad at night um, it ensures that most streets will be will be patrolled in in in, a, in that kind of form and so there are some things that that some benefits that I think along with the removing of the vehicles what would happen now we can enforce it just certain months of the year for instance from November or October till till June or we can enforce it year-round in the winter time it would work really well I believe with street cleaning the snow removal you would have to ensure that the vehicles get moved and it would be a lot easier for the street cleaners to come across and and, and clean those streets on those nights that the vehicles are not there this is a this is just one of the things that we've came up with or the only thing for right now but we're just I wanted to run that by you and uh, for the for the viewing audience just to see what kind of a reaction we would get to something like that it would be um, or if we're a way off base you know that's that's what I would like to some direction possibly thank you chief Rummel um, well, you've put it. You put the idea out on TV. Now we'll we'll see uh, what kind of reaction we get from Kay. from the public. But uh, uh, any reaction from uh, members of the commission to that possibility? They do that in the larger cities too, and it helps for snow removal, especially. Mm -hmm. An idea that came up today is possibly putting out with the utility billing department a survey out there and having the people um, respond to the survey and so I'll, I'll look into that I would like to get as much response as we could on this thing and of course we do have a website that they can certainly go on and and, and uh, tell us what they feel about something like this it would be kind of a change um, we've seen we've seen our officers have run across uh, particularly in the summertime boats and campers that park on the streets pretty much all week long and on the w in the weekends they leave um, sometimes sometimes they're parked there for a month and you know at a time so we do have that right now which this would eliminate most of that mm -hmm. I guess I guess I'm intrigued by maybe the concept of, of doing it but not doing it year-round and uh, uh, maybe in the summer months we'd be a little more tolerant and, and, and willing to roll with the punches in terms of street parking but I can, you know, your your point about the winter with snow removal, and just we just have to go back to last winter, and and you have a, um, a real good sense of what it was like for those uh, the snow removal equipment to try work on streets. And we all saw uh, streets where cars were kind of plowed around or other vehicles, and it it, it just makes for a real mess. Um, so I am kind of intrigued by the idea of it. I think for it to work, it would have to be something that would be uh, readily, I mean, generally accepted by the population. Uh, otherwise, uh, our police department would be doing nothing more than, you know, enforcing that ordinance. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, it, uh, maybe now's not the time, but I think y another time when you come back to talk about this, uh, remind us all again what a typical day for a police officer is like I mean that uh, we're busy in this community and and then there are always those non typical days like we tragically had here a couple of weeks ago and you have to set everything aside and and, and focus on an issue and, but you know I think it'd be good for us to hear you know what a typical day or a typical evening is like when we talk about things like this will do thank you if this uh, idea is a kind of a change <laughs> I wonder what a real change would be like <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to minimize it. <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I think it's an interesting idea too I and and it certainly seems like it would solve the problem I just wonder about that person who has no choice but to park in the street at night, drives the car at 7.30 every morning, comes home at 6, 
That, that's what I wonder about. I don't know how you handle that. Okay. Very good. Any other questions or comments I, other than that? I, w again, I just wanted to bring it up as a report and to put it out there around in, the, in Channel 19. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Mm -hmm. We'll move to uh, tab six, public works. That's engineering. And Mr. Soren, welcome back. We'll turn this portion over to you. Thanks, President Johnson and city commissioners. <laughs> Um, the item I have here is an engineering service agreement with Cadmus Lee and Jackson. Um, as you may recall, um, a few meetings back, I had, had brought up the point that as we're completing some of our stimulus projects, um, we're seeing that we still have some funding available for the city of Dickinson um, to possibly do an additional project. Um, the, the bid letting date on that is January 24th, I believe. And this agreement is, is um, uh, an agreement with Cadmus Lee and Jackson to do the design, a uh, preliminary and design work for um, that project. Um, the project that we're looking at, at doing is a, it's a signal controller replacement project for, I believe it's eight locations um, throughout mainly downtown Highway 22 uh, from Broadway up to Fairway and then Sims um, and First and Villard. Um, the reason that uh, uh, we're looking at that as, as kind of a uh, high need um, project is the controllers we have are 30 plus years old. Um, and, and right now we've had to go to other community, communities and, and kind of grab all the controllers that they're taking out just to, to maintain parts for the ones we have. Um, so we're needing to look at a, a replacement down the road um, one way or another. <coughs> With this additional funds of about $200,000, that will allow us to, to do this project um, kind of ahead of what we were, were planning our, our schedule to get those done. And it's a good opportunity for us to, to get some good benefit out of the money. Uh, the other issue that we have with, with these particular locations are preemption, which allows our emergency vehicles to, to actuate the controllers and, and move the, uh, the vehicles through <coughs> the, the lights on green. Um, we've had significant problems with the age of that equipment as well, and this is going to allow us to, to upgrade that too. Um, this contract's for $20,000 to do that work, and uh, I'm recommending approval um, of the contract with Cadmus Lee and Jackson. Uh, like the other projects, um, this part will be, uh, we'll pay for it up front, but with it being stimulus, we'll be able to get reimbursement for this um, along with the, the funds for the project and it is a 100% match project. Thank you, uh, Engineer Soren. Um, any comments or questions by commissioners? Okay, you've uh, heard his recommendation. Would there be a motion then? I'll make a motion to approve the signal control replacements. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? President, I'll be abstaining from the vote. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Jackson will abstain, so if there's no other discussion, we'll vote. Um, Mrs. Stuckert? Aye. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Chair votes aye. Uh, so the motion carries. The other item I have is the code enforcement report. Um, just to point out a, a couple of, of items on here. Um, our new building permits were at 93. Um, to date compared to 110 last year so we are down a little bit there uh, when we look at our our values though um, we're at uh, 39 million five hundred thousand of new values compared to 35 million uh, compared to last year um, a big portion of that is the uh, Badlands Activity Center that that is in here um, but the the values of new construction um, is up um, the one part where we are seeing a, a big increase is our additions and alterations. Um, you can see we have 181 permits uh, to date compared to 141 um, with a value of 8400000 this year compared to 4200000 last year at the same time. Um, if there's any questions uh, regarding anything else in that report, I'd certainly uh, be happy to answer those. Anything for Mr. Sorn? 
Okay. Thank you for your report. Uh, I think we'll go back to tab number four, and that was that item F that we added. Uh, and this involves uh, an Eagle Scout project. And Mr. Kessel, would you want to introduce this item? Thank you, President uh, Johnson and commissioners. Uh, the item uh, that you have before you is a community betterment project. Um, uh, as uh, President Johnson mentioned, it is a Eagles Scout project uh, and one that he is looking to complete uh, before the end of the year 2009. Uh, he is working with uh, the forestry department within the city uh, when it comes to design and uh, choices uh, being made. Uh, he is here in the audience, uh, so he can come and, and uh, take the sure. podium and present his project to you, and I can fill in the details when he's complete. Okay. Oh. Just step up to the podium and state your name and, and welcome. My name is Miles Matherin. I am currently a member of Boy Scout Troop 26 out of Dickinson. I'm working towards my Eagle Scout rank. To do so, I must complete an Eagle Scout project as stated. Um, to do so, um, all preparations have already been made in the planning of my project. And now all that is left is to finish the fundraising half of my project. The idea for my project came from me asking Skip Rapp of the city department um, if there were any trees that needed to be planted. And then after he had gotten back to me, he had suggested the planter boxes that are in front of the T-Rex plaza on the corner there. Planter boxes were originally made of railroad ties in the 1980s by nonprofit organizations, but they have since rotted out. The demolition of the planter bo old planter boxes have already has already been completed by the city's forestry department, led by Justin Alfworth. Um, now that's all that is left is to lay the retaining wall block that we have decided to use for the new planter boxes. In order to do so, as a part of my project, I need to obtain the funds for the block. The total cost of the block for the planter box is about $4,000. I myself has ra have raised the majority of the funds, but with the weather conditions becoming colder and the fact that the project is being done through the city, I thought it necessary for the city to contribute a portion of the project funds. Another factor of the Eagle Scout project is that it must be completed before my 18th birthday, and that date falls on January 15th of the coming year. So I'm asking for, the, asking for the city to possibly donate $1,000 to $1,200 to go towards the purchase of the retaining wall block so I may finish up the construction of my Eagle Scout project. We're looking to car start construction as soon as possible. We're looking at this Saturday. Um, is there any questions? Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Um, is, is everybody... Um, clear where this is located at? Okay. Any questions then? Mr. Kessel, did he miss anything that you wanted to? Well, I don't think he did. He actually gave a better report than you normally do, <laughs> but uh, but go ahead. If My Eagle Scout project is going to be on report writing the next yeah. time. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to add that uh, in our discussions, Mr. Mathern mentioned that Dickinson Ready Mix would be approached to help provide uh, supervisors during this project to make sure that installation goes well. Um, I would also like to add that he's requested traffic cones be placed uh, to address the safety issue of having uh, himself and other uh, scouts working uh, on that uh, boulevard project. Um, the last thing that I'd like to add is that um, we have all become experts, uh, or soon will be, on hospitality tax funding uh, this may be a project that is ripe for such funding. There's $500,000 uh, in that account as of today, or just under that amount. We have commitments of $160,000, leaving a balance uh, well in excess of the 1200 that has been um, requested by Mr. Mathern this evening. So your recommendation would be uh, if we approve the request for funding that it come from the 1% hospitality tax? That would be a correct. Okay. All right, commissioners, any comments or questions? Mr. President, um, 
with that intersection, I think there's no doubt that the, that's the most visible intersection in town. And, uh, you know, I, I agree that it was getting kind of, you know, the timbers were getting worn out and so on. And uh, I, I would be in full support of, of, of funds uh, be set aside to help them. I mean, looking at this weekend, you got to get it done by January 15th, correct? Yep. So hopefully you can get some good weather, keep around, you can get her done. You've raised about roughly $2,800 yourself for this? Yes. Okay. Other comments? Mr. President? Mr. Steiner, is there a motion there then? Yes, I, I would uh, move that we approve 1200 and a contingency of another 500. And it would come from? The 1%. 1% hospitality. Stated. Okay. I'll second that. We have the motion and the second. Any discussion? I wonder if it'll be unanimous. We'll vote. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Ms. Stuckart? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. <laughs> Chair votes aye. Motion carries. All right. Well, good luck with your project. And, uh, it's, uh, as Mr. Steiner said, it's getting to be a little bit of an eyesore over there, and I, I think with the uh, block design that you have in mind, I think it's going to look really nice. So, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <coughs> we'll move to the City Administrator's report. Thank you, President Johnson. Commissioners, uh, the only item that I have to report on this evening is related to the uh, emergency declaration. Uh, you have a copy of that declaration in your uh, packet this evening. Um, that declaration, this is, uh, we, we don't need ratification, just to, this is for a report only. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we required the services of the North Dakota Highway Patrol, um, the Civil Air Patrol, and uh, the National Guard uh, when we conducted searches for the three missing um, Dickinson State University students in order to uh, receive uh, funding to compensate uh, the those three entities uh, we needed to declare an emergency um, President Johnson did so uh, and uh, so did Governor Holvin so those expenses will now be covered uh, by the state of North Dakota rather than our own and just as an FYI uh, if if we did need the National Guard to send up uh, helicopters with their FLIR uh, radar um, their expense for that is about six thousand dollars per hour of use so uh, this is not a um, an expense that is, is lightly uh, taken on. So uh, we didn't need to use them, um, but if we would have, that would have been our expense. Thank you, Mr. Kessel. Does anyone have comments or questions for the city administrator? All right, not. we'll move to tab nine, which is accounts payable and payroll. Uh, are there any accounts payable you wish to discuss? Not then. Would there be a motion to approve them? So no. moved. Is there a second? Second. Any any discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Steiner. Aye. Mr. Stuckart. Aye. Mr. Jackson. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Uh, are there any reports by city commissioners or any statements? Not. Uh, are there uh, any issues of? that any member of the public wishes to present to the commission if so step to the podium state your name and we'll hear your comments there's no one from the public that wishes to address us chair would entertain a motion to adjourn so moved is there a second 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 by mr jackson all in favor please say